like here. And I worked on this project called Automatics with Michelle Annette and Daniel Wigdor when I was an undergrad at U of T, well, University of Toronto rather. Um, now I'm just starting my PhD with Dan Vogel at University of Waterloo. So let's talk for let's talk for a bit about makers. Makers are people who like to learn about, build, fabricate, personalize artifacts like electronics projects, furniture, crafts, things like that. And in general, there's a common reliance of instructions on makers and other explicit knowledge resources like instructables and how-to videos. Unfortunately, makers experience lots of challenges with explicit knowledge resources. For example, um, uh, explicit knowledge resources tend to follow a fixed prescriptive pathway for a predefined number of makers. So for example, if you've got IKEA instruction manuals, they expect that you'll follow step by step, one, one step at a time, and that you've only got one maker. So if somebody else wants to come and join in, it can be a nightmare trying to divide the tasks between the two people, and work might be duplicated. Another problem is that there's not really much support when makers want to make customizations or if they make mistakes. So say, for example, you're making a jewelry box and you actually cut one of the dimensions too short, the instructions aren't going to help you figure out how to resize the jewelry box to fix it or to recut it to make it better. Another problem is that very often makers don't have the same tools or materials that the instructions specify. Um, so say, for example, you want to screw a screw into a piece of wood and you've only got a hammer, you've got a bit of a problem. So there's lots of existing work that addresses many challenges associated with explicit knowledge resources. For example, there's guidelines to make instructions clear, which are like, for example, how do you orient a model like in, when you're printing it in 2D so that it's clearest what's going on? Where do you draw lines to show how parts are in, like getting put onto other things? Uh, there's interactive step-by-step -step assembly guides that guide users one step at a time, for example, in augmented reality through um, making, making something. And then there's augmented tools and smart environments. So for example, a screwdriver that'll tell you if you're screwing in the wrong direction. And so in general, these are great at reducing maker errors and increasing efficiency. Unfortunately though, they don't really solve these problems and many of them also introduce a new problem. Many systems only support assembly tasks and not fabrication tasks. So if you want to represent steps like painting, screwing something in, or um, sanding like something, then you can't really do that with some, some of these systems. So we present as a solution, dynamic manuals, which adapt to the maker and the environment. Uh, we have a system called Automatics that presents them to the users. It's a piece of software that runs on a tablet. Um, and we, used, we chose to make it work on a tablet rather than, for example, augmented reality. Is, is they're more, like, tablets are more common in makerspace environments than at home. Here's a very complicated overview of our system. And the point is to show that it's got lots of moving parts. I'm not going to go into all the details because this is a this is a Tokai paper actually, and so it's very long. It's and so I'm just going to highlight some of the key points as we go along. So when you first start the automatic system, you're presented with a list of artifacts that you can um, choose to, to fabricate, and then once you do that, the system shows you. Is it videoing for me? No video today either. Okay. That's okay. Video is not working, but it's not too much of an issue, I guess. All right. Yes, yeah, so let's continue on anyway. Yeah. So after you choose your your uh, artifact, you also check off that you've got all the parts that you need, and so there's a little checklist, and you can just manually check off each of the parts. And this is to reduce frustration later on, because say for example you start fabricating and you realize you don't have something, um, this will prevent that from happening. Um, and so then. Uh, this is what the actual like main view looks like. So it shows you what you're currently working on in the middle, uh, step by step, and shows you what the tool is and what you have to do to do the step. Uh, you click on the checkbox in the bottom right to proceed to the next step. And then we also show the past step, like what you were just working on in the in the corner when um, when you finish the step. And in the top right there, it shows how your current step will fit into the final artifact when it's done. So let's go back to the problems that I explained before, and I'll explain how Automatics um, addresses each of them. So the first one was that uh, instructions have a fixed prescriptive pathway for a fixed number of makers, to which our repos proposes our solution, uh, dynamic fabrication pathways. 
So rather than representing tasks as a fixed sequence like one, two, three, we represent them as what we call a task space, which is an and or graph of components. All this means is it's every single possible way that something can be fabricated. So say, for example, we take this Lego man as our example, and so we can see he's the final artifact at the top here, and we can see all of his constituent subcomponents along the bottom. And so if we look at this one particular step, um, we can see there's two ways to get here. So the one is that we take the torso, which has the backpack on it already, and connect the legs to that. And then the other is that we take the backpack and put it on the torso, which is already connected to the legs. Now imagine yourself trying to make one of these for not something with four parts, but with hundreds of parts. It'd be insanely complicated to try and enumerate all the ways that you can actually fabricate that. And so it's the same problem with the computer. And we have a couple of simple but surprisingly effective um, optimizations to make this process faster and easier. So the one process is, uh, or the, the one feature is called groups, which means that all of the parts in the group are connected to each other, and then that group is connected as a whole to the rest of the, fabrica the fabrication artifact. And then we also have subdivisions, which means that parts have to be assembled consecutively, and the order is like fixed, basically. And now this is where the videos would have been very nice, but anyway. So uh, the other way we support, another way we support dynamic fabrication pathways is multi-maker fabrication. So multiple makers can go into the same makerspace environment, connect their own tablets to the automatic system, and then tasks will automatically be divided between them so they can work together to make the artifact together. Um, we also, as part of multi-maker fabrication, we have a task overview, which shows each maker what all makers are working on right now, what they were working on beforehand, and a simulation, assuming conditions don't change, of what will happen in the future. So for example, a uh, condition that could change that will affect this if, is if another maker comes in. It'll change the number of steps that are divided between people, and so then this view would change. Um, so the simulation is useful for getting an understanding of how many tasks are left for each maker and what kind of tasks those are. To actually assign good tasks to different users, and um, uh, rather to assign tasks to different users, we use heuristics, um, four in total, and I'll outline two. Um, so one is the tool continuation score, which means, say, for example, you're working with one tool on a current step. The system will try and find tool, the, the other steps that continue to use that tool rather than continually switching tools between each step. And another one is the component similarity score, which means that you continue working on existing subassemblies rather than continually context switching between different subassemblies. Um, for full details, you can see the paper. Um, so if you... Um, for example, don't want to do a step uh, right now, or you can't do it for whatever reason, you can what we call forfeit the step, and you'd click on a little block button in the bottom right of the system, and it'll decide, leave that step for later on and assign you a different step to work on now. Um, and so you can do things that you like right now and then save things you don't like for later, but you still have to do them at some point unless another maker is working with you and does it instead. Um, so the next challenge with uh, explicit knowledge resources was that um, they don't tend to support maker customizations or help if, they make, if makers make mistakes, um, to which proposes a solution, error recovery and personalization. The first way we do this, and also unfortunately we don't have a video, but anyway, um, the first way we do this is um, if you deviate from a parameter in the model, so say for example you're making a jewelry box and the one dimension of the jewelry box you cut too short. Um, what you can specify in automatics is you just go in, type in the new dimension, the the 3D model will actually be regenerated, and then all future steps will use that new dimension so you can continue on despite your mistake. Um, this is also useful from a personalization standpoint, because say, for example, the instructions are for a small jewelry box, but you want to make a bigger one. All you have to do is right when you start, you specify the dimensions that you actually want to make it in, and then the system will automatically give you the correct instructions for your, your custom personal dimensions. Another way we support error recovery is if, for example, you just put a part on wrong in a past step. So say, for example, you're making an Ikea desk and you accidentally use a short screw instead of a long screw a couple steps ago. What you can do in Automatic is just select in the task overview here which step you made the error on, and then it'll show you a pop-up of what that step looked like, and then you can click on the part or parts that were causing the problem, and then Automatic will automatically generate disassembly instructions. So you can get back to that point and then continue on where you left off. The third challenge was that many makers, or very often makers, don't have the same tools or materials as what the instructions specify, to which we propose adapting to the environment as the solution. So say, for example, 
a tool is unavailable. Say the instructions want you to poke a hole in a piece of cardboard, or rather to, to punch a hole in a piece of cardboard with a hole punch, but you don't have a hole punch. You can go in the automatic system and then click I don't have this tool, and it will present a list of tool alternatives. For example, using a screwdriver to poke a hole instead of a hole, instead of a hole punch to punch a hole, and it will give you instructions to do that instead. This is implemented by a custom tool database that we made, um, which is just a direct directory of JSON files with tools, icons, and alternatives. The other way we adapt to the environment is forfeiting of tools, like forfeiting of, st of steps. Um, but with forfeiting of tools, say for example, you're waiting for a glue gun to heat up, or uh, somebody else is using the glue gun, so you can't use it right now, you can specify in automatics that you don't have this tool, and it'll find a different step that doesn't use that tool that you can work on in the meantime until the tool becomes available. And then the last um, challenge was uh, that many explicit knowledge resource systems only support assembly tasks, not fabrication tasks like painting or, or sanding, uh, to which we propose fabrication operations as a solution. So back to our Lego Man example here. Say, for example, rather than just putting the backpack on as is, we want to paint it first. We can specify an operation to do that, which just means we take the material, which is the initial backpack, and then the operation is painting the backpack with a paintbrush in this color. And then, so how does this fit into the task space? It fits in just like other assembly tasks. The only difference uh, in, in the actual task space is that fabrication operations only have one children. So rather than multiple things coming together, you're transforming an individual piece. So now that we've seen how dynamic manuals work, how are they actually made? One tool we have is a custom tool we made called a constraint specifier. Um, and so I'm gonna explain some of the key features here and the rest is outlined in the paper. One thing that the constraint specifier can do is specify attachments. So that's basically just what connects to what. So if we look at our Lego man, one attachment will be that the torso connects to the legs. And you can also specify other information like what animation is associated with that and what tool is associated with that. Another thing you can specify in the constraint specifier, and this is where its name comes from, is uh, constraints. And so say, for example, we're looking at our Lego man, we can see that the backpack has to go on the torso before the head can before the head goes on because the backpack can't fit over the head. And so we, using a scratch-like interface, we specify that that has to happen. Um, one thing to note here is that we don't check for reasonable con of reasonableness of constraints or automatically generate them. Because we support fabrication tasks, it might, actually, might, not, be pay might not actually be possible to determine what the order of tasks should be just by inspecting the model visually. And then ultimately, this is the output it produces. And so this is like a, the precursor to a dynamic manual. It's just a, basically a giant configuration file. So to evaluate automatics, we wanted to understand how dynamic, or dynamic instructions differ in usage from paper instructions. So we recruited six individuals and three pairs of participants to a makerspace environment to fabricate these two artifacts here, the jewelry box that I've been talking about, and also a ball launching game. Um, and they had 25 minutes to fabricate using the automatic system and 25 minutes to fabricate using each step of an automatics, like dynamic manual, printed on paper. And so we found that with automatics, all but one pair of participants were able to complete more tasks in the allotted time. Um, there were fewer mistakes that were caused by deviating from the task sequence. And when working together, there was increased communication between participants and there was a fairer division of work when participants were using the system. They also liked the idea in general and suggested extending it to other domains, like, for example, cooking and baking. Thanks so much. I like, it. I like having Dan in my session. <laughs> Dan Ashbrook, University of Copenhagen. Um, this is really nifty work. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, first of all, I was wondering if the system will support multiple users making customizations at the same time. Yes, that works. Cool. Because everyone is using the same model, uh -huh. and so it just permits, like, because people aren't doing tasks at precisely the same time, there's not concurrency issues. Okay, interesting. Um, now my other question is if there's any support for time in this. For example, I say, um, you know, I'm assembling the giant IKEA wardrobe, and I want to get chunk done in this amount of time that I have and then stop doing it for a while? 
Yeah, so I mean, I guess as is, you can just leave the system be and come back to it later on. But if yeah. I want to like complete one particular part, or like I was thinking when I was a kid, I w once attempted to build a model airplane and then got discouraged when it turned out you had to like glue parts together and then leave it. Mm -hmm. So if you could say, well, I want to uh, I want to do the gluing part first and then do something else that doesn't have to be glued while I wait for the glue to dry. Yeah, so. I mean, I guess one way that we can do this, we consider it also as future work, is like checkpointing, which I guess mm. is pretty similar uh -huh. in the sense that you say, this is the chunk of the work, and once you get here, you get even like, for example, a gamification technique. Once you get to this point, you're given an award. Mm -hmm. So something like that would, yeah. do, would uh, like, uh, achieve that, yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. Hi, uh, here. Yeah, I'm Takeo from University of Tokyo. Uh, so I think similar idea can be applicable for cooking, right? Cooking has a lot of steps and then in de de dependency situations. Have you looked into like cooking navigation literatures? No, we haven't explored cooking. I think as, you should. Yeah, and I yeah think, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah? And I think some of your ideas can be also applicable to cooking world. And I think more people cook than fabricate. So <laughs> that's yeah. maybe an interesting way to go. Thanks for the suggestion, yeah. Hi, Kendra from the University of Calgary. Um, have you measured how much longer it takes to create instructions versus the traditional methods? So we didn't focus too carefully on like, the actual design of instructions. We've sort of left that to future work. Um, in fact, even the constraint specifier application wasn't, it's sort of more of a necessity that we made it just because that output file over here is so messy to make by hand. And so we haven't really explored the actual like building side, but that's very important for future work. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker, and that concludes our session. <laughs>